Good morning. Thank you, Dave, for the kind words. Thank you, Janora, for the strong board leadership. And thank you to all our distinguished speakers and guests today. I am honored to represent South Texas on this morning. And I'm humbled to have the opportunity to briefly summarize 100 years of exceptional people, of significant moments, of profound impacts into a hopefully brief presentation. I apologize in advance because there are so many faculty and staff and students and alumni and triumphs and accomplishments that we will not mention, but let's take a few. A law school is first of all a place, a building, but our law school has been in several different locations over the years and I'm going to use those locations and our mission to tell the story of South Texas. Let's start at the beginning and transition from this Thursday, April 13, 2023, to Friday the 13th of April 1923. Warren G. Harding is in the White House, and you can read about the administration in a brand new weekly news magazine that just debuted, Time. Louis Armstrong has made his first recording with King Oliver's Creole Jazz Band. It's this. And in Egypt, Howard Carter is three days away from discovering Tutankhamun's tomb. Here in the United States, movies don't have sound. And true story, next month, the US Attorney General is going to declare that it is legal for women to wear trousers wherever they want, and not just when riding a horse. <laughs> Under what authority, I have no idea. Here in Houston, a highlight of the year is that illusionist Harry Houdini is successfully escaping from a straitjacket while hanging upside down outside the Houston Chronicle building. Take that, TikTok. <laughs> also in 1923, Santa Rita number one comes in, bringing good fortune to the region, and Houston is being shaped by an extraordinary confluence of events. Energy is booming, Railroads are growing, the economy and the regional population are expanding, the financial sector is vibrant. And across the country, local YMCAs have created professional education programs for working individuals in fields like accountancy and law. And here in Houston, our local YMCA, as Steve mentioned, supported by in the bar and the bench, did the same. And exactly 100 years ago today, April 13th, 1923, 15 of Houston, Houston's foremost legal and business leaders gathered. And they signed the paperwork to establish a law school to meet the needs of a growing city, South Texas School of Law. We know it was a warm spring day and the room would have been stuffy because air conditioning was only in one building in town, the Second National Bank and no one grabbed a cell phone to grab a picture for some reason. Those visionary leaders made a commitment that this law school would provide an education of exceptional quality, a standard we uphold to this day. From its founding as part of the YMCA, South Texas School of Law sought to provide men and women the opportunity to pursue their dreams of obtaining the otherwise unobtainable, a law degree and of serving their communities with distinction, and of transforming their lives. The destinies of this law school and of this city have been intertwined from the start, and the early leadership of South Texas reflected that strong connection. You have heard much about Joseph C. Hutchison, Jr., selected by the Advisory Council to be the founding dean of the law school. In addition to being a brilliant mind, his granddaughter, Joanne, has also told us that he had a beautiful singing voice and a wicked sense of humor. Unfortunately, that means I'm 0 for 3. <laughs> the choice of Judge Hutchinson, however, set a high standard of excellence that continues through today. And he also set a vision for this law school. In 1923, here's what Judge Hutchinson wrote. We will promise nothing now as to what we will fulfill for we believe that we can do much more than we can now promise. While Judge Hutchison could not have imagined all the changes the ensuing decades would bring to the world and to the legal profession, he understood that great things would be expected of this school and of its graduates. Let's walk through a little bit of the history. 
When our first class arrived in the fall of 1923, the population, as you have heard, was just 140,000 people. The 19th Amendment had only recently been passed, giving women the franchise. And oil is $1.34 a barrel. The law school began classes on September 24, 1923, on the third floor of the YMCA building. Tuition and fees at that time were $90. <laughs> Here the students groan. <laughs> Our first class of students were these pioneering law school students. You will note the five women in the class. You will also note that they are wearing significantly too many clothes for a building without air conditioning. <laughs> I'll mention three students from those early days. One was Anne Marie Hollenberg, who's our first female graduate in 1928, years before women were even admitted at many law schools. Another was Evita Kalp Hobby, who audited classes at South Texas before going on to many positions in the state and the country, including being the first secretary of what we now know as Health and Human Services. The third is a gentleman named Fred Parks, who enrolled at South Texas in the 1930s. Raised by a single mother of limited means after his father abandoned the family, Fred worked blue-collar jobs to support the family. He graduated in 1937 after putting himself through school. There are reports that he slept in the city graveyard because he was destitute. Here is his, hand, his granddaughter, Ann Stallings. All of you who knew my grandfather knew that he was a determined man. He basically had nothing growing up except his will to survive. He struggled to make ends meet, and at times he didn't even make that. Through the hardships, though, he relied on his being able to learn, and studying law gave him the power to rise above his circumstances. After graduating from South Texas, Mr. Parks went on to become one of the most successful attorneys in town. His generous financial support of the law school made possible the world-class library facility that has benefited our students, our faculty, our staff, and the community for 20 years. Mr. Parks had a good friend, George Herbert Walker Bush. At the dedication of that Fred Parks Law Library in November of 2001, President Bush remembered Mr. Parks. The concept I call being one of a thousand points of light. Uh, when I first said that, the guy said, did you say pints of light? <laughs> I said, no. No, it, it, no one ever accused me when I was president of being a good speaker. I clarified it for him. I said, no, one of a thousand points of light. And Fred, Fred, Fred Parks was a shining example of what I mean by that, of giving something back and simply lifting the lives of others. Uh, for example, this Sunday we celebrated Veterans Day. At age 36, Fred put his private legal career on hold to serve his country in World War II. And the point is, through his life, he answered when duty and decency called him. And this library, which will serve so many for so long, is a perfect tribute. While we mourn the passing of a great man, we do so today while celebrating his remarkable life. And so congratulations to all of you, everyone associated with this school in one way or another. I'm so pleased that you were all introduced uh, at the beginning of this program. Congratulations on this special day, and my thanks to all uh, in the extended South Texas family for inviting me to be here with you today. Just part of a tribute to a wonderful man. Thank you ever so much. A wonderful man, isn't it? A wonderful man and wonderful service, one of the hallmarks of our mission at South Texas. And speaking of service, we can't talk about these students without talking about some of the original faculty. From the law school's beginning, one of South Texas's signature strengths has been its dedicated, exceptional faculty. Look at this early description of the faculty. The most successful lawyers and ablest judges, representing the best spirit of public service, and perhaps most important for this particular law school, the recognition of a profound responsibility to mentor and train the next generation of attorneys. An example of that early practitioner as professor model 
is Judge Spurgeon Bell. Judge Bell became an adjunct professor in 1933 when he substituted for another Judge Bell, his father Holland. Judge Spurgeon Bell served as a faculty member for some 50 years and a chair of our school's board of directors. He was an attorney, a judge for the 125th Court, and later an associate and chief justice of the Texas First Court of Appeals. He inspired generations and was a mentor to countless students. In fact, in the 1970s, he was interviewed by a student at the time, a gentleman named Evan Glick, for our student paper, Annotations. Evan asked Judge Bell for guidance. What do I do if I want to become a judge? Judge Bell's advice, show that you are a good lawyer. Apparently, student Evan Glick and then lawyer Evan Glick took that advice because he became Judge Evan Glick here in Harris County. Strong faculty, committed mentorship, rigorous curriculum, all true now as it was then. Quick aside, by the way, from the 1920s, many people became licensed attorneys at the time by being an apprentice and then taking the bar exam. South Texas's faculty and curriculum were so strong, however, that students who graduated here only needed to show their diploma. They did not need to take the bar exam. <laughs> Just saying, Justice Hecht. <laughs> By 1942, the law school and the YMCA's success and growth led the YMCA to build a new 10-story building at 1600 Louisiana. We moved with them. This building became our home for the next two decades. When our first classes began in the building, the population of Houston had tripled to 400,000 people. At the end of the year, the U.S. will join, join World War II, and Houston has already become known as the most air-conditioned city in the world. By the way, the price of oil has dropped. It's now only $1.14 a barrel. A few years later, at the end of World War II, the GI Bill will allow veterans to come to law school. So many, in fact, that the enrollment at South Texas tripled between 1945 and 1946 from 56 students to 162. And with that growth came the addition of new opportunities for students, opportunities such as the South Texas Law Journal in 1953. This quarterly journal was the first law review in the city of Houston, now known as the South Texas Law Review. It and our other prestigious journals remain a mark of distinction for our graduates. Later that decade, the school's quality was recognized with provisional accreditation from the American Bar Association, and South Texas introduced a full-time program to complement the part-time program. And we continued our mission of providing opportunities, opportunities to capable and eager potential law students. In the early 1960s, one of those was a young Floridian, a man named E.J. Salcines. When I first started law school, I did not start at South Texas. And I went to see my professor, and my professor said, what did you say your name was? And I said, Salcines, sir. And he said, oh, that's Italian. No, sir, my parents are from Spain. And then that professor said, I'm not surprised that you're having difficulty with my course. You Latins are too emotional to be attorneys. Choose another profession. Hard to believe. So EJ did not choose another profession. He chose another law school. And I can think I can speak for all of South Texas. When we say we are glad that he did not. Indeed, another through line of our South Texas education is this alumni continuing commitment to current students. And EJ has been a model of that par excellence. If you did not know, through his support from Tampa, countless Floridians have made their way to South Texas and then returned to productive careers in the Sunshine State. 
And by the way, how did E.J. do in that profession that he chose? Well, the Honorable E.J. Salcines became a pillar of the Tampa legal community, so much so that the city of Tampa erected a statue in his honor outside of the courthouse in Tampa, Florida. And E.J. is unequivocal. He credits his success to South Texas. In fact, after he received our most prestigious award, the Dean's Medal, in 2021, his closing words were, thank you to South Texas for giving me the opportunity of a lifetime. So 1964, the year after EJ graduate, graduated, South Texas moved again, away from the YMCA building for the first time in our 40-year history, to our current location, but with an address at 1220 Polk Street. In 1964, nearly a million people now call Houston their home. NASA is responding to President Kennedy's cha challenge to go to the moon, and the eighth wonder of the world is just about completed. And oil is still now at $1.80 a barrel. Now that South Texas has relocated away from the YMCA building, the law school soon dissolves its longstanding relationship with the YMCA and becomes the private and independent law school it remains today. South Texas continued to lead and to innovate, though, becoming the first Texas law school to award a JD degree. And exceptional individuals continued to come. One of them was a man named Garland Walker, whom Judge Bell recommended as dean in 1968. Nearly everyone at South Texas from those days has a Garland Walker story. And I have been told many of them. I've been told that he had a knack for seeing potential in people and that he had a penchant for admitting candidates based on gut instinct. I'm quite confident that Justice Hecht and the ABA expect us to use some other criteria other than gut instinct. But I can't tell you how many graduates have said some version of the following phrase to me. Garland Walker took a chance on me. He gave me an opportunity, and I owe my career to him and to South Texas. The law school's reach and contribution has continued to increase, and by 1972, one of every six attorneys in Harris County is a South Texas graduate. As we continue to grow, we offer a healthy balance of exceptional practitioners, as well as an increasingly prominent full-time teaching faculty and the campus grew to match this success. In 1976, our nation's bicentennial year, South Texas dedicates the three-story addition at our current address that we are now in, the Jesse H. Jones Law Building. Houston's population is now 1.2 million people. The Galleria opens. Some 200 major companies have their headquarters here, and the Arab oil embargo has caused the price of oil to shoot to $11.53 a barrel. A few years later, Dean Walker hires T. Gerald Treese to direct the advocacy program. Under Dean Treese, the program flourishes, and just two years later, our advocates bring home their first national championship. We have not slowed down since. To date, the advocacy team boasts 141 national titles, twice as many as any other law school. And And that doesn't count the regional wins, Scribes Awards, Best Brief Awards, and countless other speaking awards. One secret to the success is the fact that advocacy graduates come back to coach the next generation, helping us to remain a national power choice, a powerhouse. Dean Treese loved the law. He loved teaching. And he also offered a second reason in addition to these coaches, that South Texas is successful. And so in a way, I think mom, all mom ever wanted me to be is a Church of Christ preacher. 
I promise you that's true. And, you know, she prayed every day that I would, I would turn away. And I started out to be a preacher. I went to one, one year at a, at a Christian college, and I promise you, the only person on the planet who thought I should be a preacher was my mother. <laughs> the school definitely, unanimously said, he sh this man has way too many questions. And he needs to be anything but that. But I was telling Sue last night, maybe in a way I have become a minister. Because I'm teaching the same principles to my students. You play hard. You play by the rules. You play fair. And you work harder than everybody else. That's the secret, Dean. Our teams are not only talented, they just work harder than everybody else. And I, you guys are nodding your heads. You know that. There's no secret to this. We had a security guard here about 10 years ago. And he one time said, do you guys ever sleep? <laughs> no. Not during the Avisy season. Baylor sleeps. <laughs>Okay, so watching that clip, I'm glad that Dean Tobin appeared by video. <laughs> Dean Treese is right, however. South Texas students do work hard. They do compete. They don't take opportunities for granted. And they do succeed. With the incredible growth of our city in the 1980s gro came growth for our downtown law school here at South Texas. In 1984, our footprint at 1303 San Jacinto increased by 130% as we opened our new 11-story tower building. Houston population, 1.5 million. Don't mess with Texas and J.R. Ewing is how everybody recognizes the state. And the price of oil has doubled, 28.78 a barrel. Before now, South Texas had been a school of opportunity for so many. And increasingly, as Houston became more diverse, South Texas created opportunities for diverse populations as well. In 1968, Mamie Proctor walked the stage as our first black graduate. And Gladys Goffney, who is here with us today, a 1971 graduate, in the past two years has been recognized by the State Bar of Texas and the American Bar Association for 50 years of continuous law practice. And in 1987, Professor and Executive Price, Vice President Emerita Helen Jenkins taught her first class at South Texas. I was, and still am, very proud to have been the first African-American female uh, professor to be tenured in a law school in Texas at a non-minority law school in Texas. That's a very proud part of who I am. Uh, at the time, it was 1992, and I thought to myself, well, gosh, how did it, how come it took us so long to get to this point? But in 2022, we're still talking about the first African Americans to do this, or that, and the other. So um, uh, I, I hope I served as a role model for, for others uh, who wanted to come into the profession and made me very proud to hold that place in history. Dean Jenkins indeed has been a role model and others have followed. <laughs> Students like Derek Johnson, a 1997 graduate who's now the president of the NAACP and Texas Supreme Court Justices, Eva Guzman, David Medina, and landmark civil rights attorneys like Mitchell Katine. More recently, Kenesha Starling served as the first black editor-in-chief of our school's flagship journal, the South Texas Law Review. Eric Williams II served as our first black valedictorian. And of course, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge South Texas graduate, Benny Agosto who with his wife, Nicole, as you have heard, has made possible the Augusto Diversity Center, which will set the bar for diversity programming in legal education. Thank you, Benny. <laughs> diversity is emblazoned in our mission statement. There is much work to be done. 
but we are up to the challenge. Being in the heart of downtown is an important part of South Texas' identity and of our strength. It means that internships and externships are right up the street. It means courts are within walking distance when they're not actually in the building itself. Not only did the tower afford the opportunity to host the first and the 14th courts of appeals, but this very room was the courtroom where the first court of appeals heard the appeal of Pennzoil versus Texaco. One of the largest civil verdicts in history, $11 billion. Even with inflation in the last 38 years, that's still a lot of money. <laughs> While watching a significant appeal is one thing, practicing legal skills is something else. And at South Texas, the opportunity to engage in experiential leg le legal education really came in its, to its own in 1990, when the South Texas Disability Clinic opened down the street at 1602 San Jacinto. Since then, with generous support from the Texas Access to Justice Foundation, the Rockwell Fund, alumnus Randy Sorrells, and so many others, our clinics have expanded and are now the largest and most robust clinical programs in the state of Texas. <laughs> Students today choose from some 20 different clinical programs, externships, and various pro bono opportunities, gaining practical experience and skills, learning professionalism, developing their professional identity, and instilling their understanding of service. As important, however, these clinics allow South Texas to make a dent in the access to justice gap, providing some three and a half million dollars worth of service every year to the indigent and underserved communities. I think the clinics are so important for our students because they expose our students to two really important things. One, an awareness of the justice gap so that people who don't have resources in our community don't have access to lawyers. And my students today are going to be policymakers of the future. They're going to be the judges and the lawmakers and partners in major firms and directing philanthropy dollars. And if they know what those justice gaps are, um, they're going to find ways to address them and solutions. So part of what I love about the clinic is the exposure uh, to the justice gap and inculcating that value of service. We're a service profession. Houston is a better city because South Texas and its clinics are here to serve it. As we enter the new millennium, the final piece of our construction puzzle falls into peace with the dedication of the Fred Parks Law Library. Houston's population is now two million people. The Toyota Center is being built across the street and oil is down to only 24.48 a barrel. South Texas continued to excel though. In the 2000s, the South Texas Law Review celebrates its golden anniversary. Our advocates achieve their 100th win, and the T. Gerald Treese courtroom was dedicated with members of the Texas Supreme Court present for the ceremony. And in the last two decades, South Texas has continued to innovate as well. Judge Frank G. Evans was known as the father of alternative dispute resolution and he was associated with our law school for decades. The program he helped nurture here has gained a national reputation, so much so that the center was named for him in 2004. On the business side, the law school's transactional practice certificate was one of the first offered in the country. And more recently, and continuing our innovative streak, South Texas has launched one of the country's first fully online JD programs in the fall of 2023, exactly 100 years after our first students walked into the YMCA on Fannin Street. Groundbreaking and innovative and visionary, words like this have been associated with our school through the decades. And all of us here today should recognize the sense of responsibility and obligation we have to keep that momentum going forward. Which brings us to today. 
Houston's population is just shy of 2.3 million, but 5 million more are in the nine surrounding counties. We've endured a global pandemic. Technology controls our life. This entire address was written by a chatbot. And the oil is now. Just seeing if you were paying attention. And oil closed last night at $83.19. Talk about inflation. Today, our law school continues to ex attract exceptional faculty, staff, and adjuncts who are drawn to the law school's mission, are dedicated to excellence, and are committed to our students' success. And we continue to draw ever more capable students who are willing to challenge the world. Today, women comprise 54% of our students. Nearly half the student population identifies as minority. Student organizations and alumni groups provide added community support for black, Hispanic, and Asian students and alumni, LBGTQ community members and allies, women, and even, I understand, Aggie law students. <laughs> Yesterday I said, and we'll get a whoop. Today, we have more than 16,000 alumni working and leading in law firms, boardrooms, government offices, in public service, and everything in, all, in everything in between, across Texas, across our country. And please think for about, just for a moment, all the other individuals, the faculty members, the staff, the students, the former deans, the former board members, the alumni, everyone else that I did not have time to mention. This already long address could continue to our centen centennial gala, which is on September 23rd. Please mark your calendar now. We're in their debt. We stand on their shoulders. They built the foundation that we enjoy today. I stand here today in awe of what this law school has accomplished since 1923. The opportunities created, the doors opened, the minds sharpened, the lives changed. That is perhaps even more than the 15 founders of the law school might have deemed possible 100 years ago today. South Texas has contributed greatly to the legal community, has changed the face of Houston and of Texas. Our graduates have been successful. They have argued in the highest court in the land, as Lynn Liberato did when she charmed Justice Scalia in 1993. Ms. Liberato, does, does everybody say you bury my fidei, or is it, is it just people from Texas? Is that, <laughs> is, that, is that really how you say that? I mean, everybody says it that way? Judge Scalia, uh, it's only Italians from Texas who I say it that way. <laughs> Only Italians in Texas. Uh, graduates have served our communities. They've led some of our largest companies. They've served as judges and in public service. They have led law firms. I could go on. But the next generation of South Texas graduates, they will be an inspiration. Students like Anna, a third year law student, a mother of four, a business owner, a president of both the Women's Law Society and the Asian Pacific American Law Students Association, and this year's recipient of the Students' Award for Best Graduate. Students like Sarah, a 1L, who is part of our part-time flex program. Sarah lives in Beaumont and has a full-time job. And it is only because of our Flex part-time JD program that she could obtain a law J degree. And folks like Maddie, who has already accomplished two national championships in advocacy. She's a 2L. Longtime board member and community leader Don Jordan had this to say about the future of the law school when he spoke at the dedication of the Fred Parks Law Library in 2001. But there's one thing that's been certain in this city for quite a long time, since 1923, the South Texas College of Law, whether it was doing business in the YMCA down the street or in this great facility here, has consistently turned out good contributing students who not only have continue to do their work here in Houston, but have moved around the United States and perhaps around the world 
to make contributions not only to the follow to the follow up of the law, but to work in businesses around this country to help make this world and this city and this country an even better place. It is uh, with some certainty that I can tell you that I believe this school will continue to grow, not only in physical plant, but in programs that it will offer to young people who will continue to come here from around the United States. His words are not dissimilar to our founding dean, J.C. Hutchinson's comments when we first opened our door. I am confident that those founders would be proud of the law school they have created and what it has done and become. But our theme for this centennial is not just to honor the past and not just to celebrate the present, but also to build the future. That means we cannot stop here. Dean Hutchison was prophetic in 1923. We can do much more than we can now promise. He could not have anticipated all that has happened in the century since, and we cannot anticipate all that will happen in the century to come. Here is a reality. The law school of the future does not yet exist. It is our collective responsibility to envision it, and then it is our responsibility to create it. The anthem that you're hearing now is Aaron Copeland's fanfare for a common man. It was written in 1942 to, in recognition of those who were embarking on the war effort. As we reflect on what our school has been, is now, and will be, I find it apt. The common man he celebrates in this theme are hardworking. They're part of a community. They do unto others. They treat each other with fairness, with dignity. They help those in need. They pitch in. They do their part. And South Texas and the faculty and staff and students and alumni and supporters and all who love her is very similar. There's a different feel at South Texas. It's a unique blend of community connection, of scrappy, hardworking underdogs, of confident dreaming, of supportive and challenging environments in which students seize the opportunity and persist with all of their might. At South Texas, we don't want to be every other law school. We're proud of being a vibrant downtown law school willing to provide opportunities. We embrace diversity. We believe in pushing students hard and supporting them with equal tenaciousness. We're not a weed out law school, we are a help up law school, where faculty and staff mentor students and alumni return to help the next generation. Very simply, for 100 years, this law school has given people a chance and future generations are counting on us, the leaders today, to innovate, to evolve, to meet the ever-changing needs of the legal profession, and to provide that door to the legal profession to the next generation. We are the stewards of this great institution, of its history, of its tradition, of its legacy, of its reputation, and of its commitment to diversity, opportunity, excellence, and service. Many times this year I have been asked, what will the next 100 years, what will happen? I would submit that's the wrong question. The right question is what will we do at South Texas to approach this next 100 years? We will remain true to our history. We will remain true to our mission. We will strive for excellence in all we do. We will commit ourselves to diversity. We will continue to create opportunity and we will be bold in service to our community, to Houston and to the profession. I repeat, the law school of the future does not yet exist, but we can build it. I look forward to doing that work with you. This school may be 100 years old, but our work is just beginning. To the next century of South Texas College of Law, Houston. <laughs>